heavy vehicles, plant and equipment. Uh, I deal with a number of insurance companies and um, to say they keep us busy, yeah, I mean uh, this year alone I've done so far six um, forensic examinations of uh, fire damaged trucks, plant and equipment. So um, what I've done for want of a better title, accidental or incendiary, what I'm going to present tonight involves two effectively case studies from matters I've done earlier in the year. Um, one is in fact incendiary and the other is accidental. So um, let's see how we go. Okay, and I'm getting ahead of myself on the sides. As I've said, uh, presentation discussed two vehicle fires. Both were trucks, both were parked at the time of ignition of fire, and both vehicles sustained sufficient damage to cause each of the vehicles to be written off. Just a point on that, generally if a motor vehicle has a fire, it's going to, get, it's going to be a write-off. There's no a's, ifs or buts about it. Um, okay. Scenario number one, um, 2015 Isuzu NQR450 tilt tray. Time of theft, the vehicle was parked outside the owner's home um, in a western suburb of Sydney. As I've said here, streets are cul-de-sac, so there's no through traffic. Uh, the fire was in the main confine of the cabin of the vehicle. Fire was discovered at 0128 hours by the owner who then made furtive attempts with a garden hose to put it out. He failed. Vehicle was new. Vehicle was under finance. The business was just starting and only had made $900 in 12 days. And before purchasing the vehicle, the owner was unemployed. I thought I'd throw that in. That's the investigator side of me working as opposed to the fire investigator working. Uh, in fact, on this one, my client, we started out, find out what, what caused the fire and uh, tell us all about it. And then halfway through, they also asked me to, to conduct a factual investigation of the fire, which um, meant they got two reports, the forensic side and then the, the factual side. Interesting situation. Um, I can't go too much into that, but uh, it certainly opened my eyes with some of the information that came out. This is what's left of our vehicle. Um, examination was done at the premises of Mannheim Auctions over in Moorbank, and usually insurance companies will get a vehicle off scene, much to my chagrin and put it into a, um, an auction yard. So by the time I get to it, I rarely get a chance to actually look at the scene of the fire. Um, and that is important. On this particular truck, I actually went over um, and looked at the street, looked at the surroundings to get a feel for it. Unfortunately, after the, uh, the truck was taken away, the owner, being a neat individual, went out and hosed everything down and moved all the broken glass. Um, so, you know, there, there are some important things which I'll get to in a short time. Okay, this is a view of the, uh, the back of the truck. Um, we've got some smoke damage here, but Tyres, everything um, down the side was fine. There, there was, if the smoke damage wasn't there and you didn't look at the cab, you'd hey, that's a new truck, great. Control box for the tilt tray. Um, batteries in this truck are just in here between the front wheel and this chrome face toolbox. This was interesting. This is, of course, the um, offside of the vehicle. 
uh, one point, we never ever use driving side, passenger side. It's offside, being the driving side, or near side for the, um, for the thing, because sometimes you get a vehicle that doesn't have a passenger side to it. This tyre was completely gone. This witch's hat showed uh, thermal damage. And of course, we've got these two nice burn patches. Uh, because I'd seen, been at the scene, that made sense. And it made sense because the owner had parked the truck in the street, but the wrong way round. The offside was in the gutter. That, that was a, a bit of a clue. So why, if we have the whole cabin burnt, and then we've got these offside tyres gone too? Interesting. OK, scenario number two. This one's a 1997 Freightliner. Uh, FCL 112 rigid chipper. Oh. I'll just kill this. Um, Freightliner rigid chipper. At the time of the fire, the vehicle was parked inside a large corrugated iron shed in southwestern New South Wales. The vehicle had been parked at 1800 hours and was discovered smouldering at 0.45 hours uh, by an associate of the owner. The fire was in the main confined to the cabin of the vehicle. The vehicle had been regularly serviced, which is an important thing when you're dealing with motor vehicles. Was it serviced? If so, how regularly? And who serviced it? Generally, when I'm dealing with these, either as for a forensic examination or through uh, a factual investigation, I will ask the owner for at least 12 months of service records. I want to know what's been done to the truck and who's been doing it. <coughs> like the uh, vehicle in scenario one, damage was mainly confined to the cabin of the vehicle, and of course it had. Uh, a new HVAC unit in storm four weeks prior to the theft. Okay, this vehicle, 19 years old, regularly serviced. Owner operated a large uh, farming property and used the vehicle as a supplementary source of income. So he had a, another stream of income. The vehicle, though, was pulling about three hundred thousand dollars a month which wasn't bad for a rigid tipper and a dog trailer this is our shed and this is the back of the dog trailer we can see here some smoke damage this light interestingly um, at 2 a.m. in the morning that light was still on We'll get to that in a minute. This is inside the shed. And again, we've got all this smoke staining on the corrugated iron and so on. The, the shed construction walls, roof was corrugated iron. The, um, the main frame and purlins were of steel construction. However, these horizontal beams were timber. There's uh, a photograph of the truck. As you can see, from here forward, not a lot left. From here back, it's pretty much similar circumstance to the other truck. Um, and it had been put in that position, as I said, at uh, 1800 hours the evening before the fire was discovered. Okay, both cases, we have vehicle that's parked when ignition occurred. As the engine was, uh, as neither of the engine was operating, it was reasonable to conclude that fires were as a result of an electrical or were incendiary in nature. Scenario one, the vehicle was parked and locked on the street. Scenario two, the vehicle was parked, unlocked in the shed. 
let's put it this way, this little country town was busy. You could lay in the middle of the main street and wait half an hour before somebody ran you over. Okay, scenario one, we're back to our tail trade. Um, first looked at the electrical system. I needed to eliminate it or include it, as the case may be. As I've said here, the only modification to the electrics of this brand new Isuzu was the modification made by the people that put the tilt tray on it, and that was a direct connection to the batteries, and that was fused. And those wires went up to that grey control box I pointed out earlier. This is the inside of the control box of our truck. Hey, it looks pretty good. There's nothing melted in there and uh, all good. Um, our fuses were intact. Uh, same with the batteries. There was no damage to the batteries. And I thought, oh, OK. If this caused a fire, I would expect to see damage in there or damage to the wiring connecting that box to the batteries. We had none. Engine wasn't running, so mechanics weren't in, in play. OK. Examine the batteries free of damage. Turn the attention to the door locks. Why? Well, it occurred to me that if it wasn't electrical, and we had reason to believe it wasn't electrical, it was possibly incendiary. If it was incendiary, did anybody get into the truck? So we started looking for them and, of course, keeping in mind if we found any of the door locks, it could be a situation where we could involve a forensic locksmith and have the forensic locksmith tell me whether or not those locks have been uh, forcibly manipulated with anything other than the OEM key. Being a new truck, um, the, the locks would have been in very good condition. So if somebody had put something in there other than the OEM key, it would have really stood out. Okay, here's our two door locks which were found in the door wells of the truck. Near side, off side. Um, the first clue is the escutcheon ring, which is normally stainless steel. There's no damage to either escutcheon ring. There's no damage to the keyway of the lock. That means somebody hasn't gone along with a thumping great screwdriver and jammed it in uh, and forcibly rotated the lock in the door skin. Um, unfortunately with the Isuzu's and the, the later model Isuzu's, that door lock sits in a thermoplastic moulded handle on lock body. So if somebody did forcibly rotate the lock body there's nothing to tell you that it's been forcibly rotated um, because the plastic's gone. So we're fairly, I was fairly happy with that. Down here we can see one of the lock wafers. We did not have all of the lock, but again, if I took that to a forensic locksmith, um, it would have been a situation where he would have examined and given me an answer. As it turned out, we didn't need to do that. The other thing I should point out is that when I'm looking for these lock bodies um, in vehicles and I find them, I take a photograph of the lock body in situ. Once it's in situ, then we take it out. There's no possibility of fingerprints on it. So I don't need to move about it gingerly and use nitrile gloves or other devices to lift it out. So we take it out and I photograph it again. Once it's photographed again outside the truck, it then goes into a numbered evidence bag and that evidence bag is complete. All the details are put on it 
and sealed so that I can maintain a chain of evidence should we need to take it off to a forensic locksmith or anybody else. These photographs were taken in the office um, and they were basically taken out of the evidence bag they were in, uh, photographed and then resealed into a new evidence bag with the number panel from the first evidence bag in as well and the details of why it's been resealed into another evidence bag. I collect a lot of junk. Okay, now this is the offside. We're just behind the front wheels and this is the fuel tank on the offside. That is what's left of a shovel. Fiberglass handle. Now, apart from our fuel tank having a nice sooty residue underneath, um, which was hand under, oh yeah, great, good. I found that and I thought, well, the fire was under the truck. This, of course, was parked right over the gutter. Had our owner not been as pedantic about keep keeping a neat street, I would have seen a lot of other things that um, would have been relevant. So, I'm seeing this and I'm thinking, gee, this looks like incendiary. So we decided to do a debris layer search. This is in the passenger side footwell. And I've gone down and we've got layers of plastic. We've got what's left of the windscreen and the side window and it's forming a nice barrier. So I've got a, I've got a, a long prize bar which works well on these things. And we got through and here I found a manual. And it was wet and it smelt very odd. I thought, oh, wet, okay, good. So I've labelled up a sample can. Um, I, these sample cans that I use um, grey epoxy line because a lot of the samples I take are wet and the epoxy lining stops them from rusting. Don't use the gold one. There's been a IAAI alert on the gold line epoxy cans. Apparently there's a bit of a question about them contaminating your samples and giving false readings. So, got that. I've labelled it up. I've taken the photograph where I've taken the sample from. Um, took the sample put it in, close the lid, put an evidence seal across the lid and dated the lid. And then I went further into that manual and got right down to the bottom and took a second sample. I went through the same process. And then it was off to our good friend, Wong Stern. And this is what we got. Sample two was the wetter of the two, and I thought that was going to be the, the one that really worked. However, it was sample one that returned significant quantities of toluene, xylenes, trimethylbenzenes, and pres uh, present in ratios of a petroleum hydrocarbon fraction. Now, keep in mind, the truck's diesel powered. What the hell is petrol doing inside the cab? Had our owner not cleaned up the street, um, I think I would have been taking some a control sample of the street, where the truck was, near the gutter, and uh, a control sample away from that, and also ran those for... Uh, gas chromography, mass spectrometry. Because what I think has caused the damage to the offside and the tyre and the um, shovel was I think 
that they not only dosed the cab of the truck with petrol, but they've spread it around under the cab and it's flowed, given the camber of the road, down into the gutter and then ran along the gutter and that's lit up the back uh, drive tyres and all the rest of it. Um, but we couldn't do that um, again because the owner's gone out, gone out and really cleaned things up nicely. Um, so that indeed was an incendiary fire. Um, we've followed as much as possible a scientific method, although when you're doing with vehicles, plant and equipment, sometimes you can't really go to uh, the scientific method. Um, I mean, Friday of last week I was crawling all over a $100,000 excavator that went up in flames. I think it was a hydraulic leak. I'm 99.9% .9 sure it was a hydraulic leak. But I wasn't going back to the client and saying, listen, uh, yeah, we think it was a hydraulic leak. I need $100,000 because I want to buy one of these things. I want to cause a hydraulic leak and let's see if it burns to the ground. Because I know what the insurance company would say. No. OK, scenario two was in the shed at time of ignition. As I've said, shed constructed of corrugated iron, suffered smoke damage. Apart from this, the entire electrical system of the shed was not working. Um, had poly water piping, which was ran above the truck. And of course, we've got elevation, we've got an ignition source, so it melted. Um, in fact, the, the fact that it melted probably did some help to the fire. And of course, horizontal beams of timber with steel frame construction. Now, this is interesting. Here's our truck over here. As you can see, it's about a metre away from the wall. This jumble of parts used to be stored in a timber box. There's no timber box anymore. On top of that, this beam, see from here to here, it's not there anymore, it burnt away. The, these windows, the glass louvers, and the bottom louver had a classic thermal shock brake pattern in it. It was really nice. But, you know, we've got drums of, some of these drums are empty, some of them were full. Um, you know, and they're, they're still sitting there, there's been no ignition, but the timber box went. We've got nice staining here, and uh, of course that timber beam gone. Okay. <laughs> With heavy vehicles these days, fiberglass and composite materials are used a lot. Um, so you don't have nice steel panels. You know the doors are they're good. Um, as you can see, the bonnet's completely gone. But the part that I found interesting is these vertical behind cab spoilers. They're fiberglass and they're still there. As you can see this one, we've got heat fire damage down here. That's basically just the paint on the surface of the thing gone. But here we've got all the, all the paint. It's good. Um, batteries in this one was a problem. Between the two chassis rails, Immediately behind the cab, we couldn't raise the tipping body because there was just no hydraulics. Um, I could stick my head through and say, oh, yeah, that looks uh, OK, yeah, right. Uh, but as far as doing anything else with them, forget it. It was, it was gone. Fully serviced mid-January, approximately seven weeks before the fire. However, four weeks before, before the fire, we had this HVAC unit fitted um, on the roof of the cab. 
uh, presentation of the vehicle and the shed suggested a slow smouldering fire. Um, I mean, if it had been anything bigger than that, I would have expected to see some defamation in the corrugated iron, particularly immediately above the truck, even though we had a, a fair amount of airspace. Um, but there was a skylight, glass skylight in the roof. The glass skylight, it was one of these skylights that um, had um, chicken wire embedded in the glass. And that had cracked, but that's as far as it went. So it was ostensibly intact. So, again, the truck wasn't operating, engine wasn't running, so we can immediately rule out mechanical failure. There's our HVAC unit up on the roof. As you can see, the roof has sagged a little bit. And that wasn't particularly heavy. I mean, after I uh, got up there and used my reciprocating saw to cut the bolts, there's four bolts holding that thing on, and you try, we tried to unscrew them with um, sockets and that, and it was just, they were all just rotating. So I thought, right, I can't do any more damage to the truck, so let's get the saw on, you know, in less than five minutes, the good old Ryobi had that off. Before I did it, this is what I'm looking at. This is part of one of the air horns. Front of the truck here, back of the truck there. So we've got the condenser. We've got the dry unit. This thing here is the um, valve for the evaporator, and that's the evaporator and these round structures are the two screw and cage fans of the blower unit. And these units are essentially, they're made in the US, they're sent out here, packaged in cardboard boxes and all the rest of it, and all the installers need to do is cut a hole in the roof per the template that comes with it, bore the holes, take it out, bolt it on and then they don't even need to take the cover off these things. They've got the wires, they've got the coating of the wires, they've got the um, tubes that join up to the um, compressor that's on the side of the engine. So they don't have to do anything at all inside that unit. And all the controllers of the unit, when the hole that's cut in the roof when it drops in, the controls are there on the bottom of the unit for the driver to turn on and off and so on. So um, it struck me that um, there's very little the installers could have done to possibly cause a fire. But just coming back, yellow arrow shows the condenser. Oh, sorry, the yeah, the condenser. Red arrow is the evaporator. Green arrow is the um, blower fan. And the, this turquoise arrow shows the uh, drying unit. What we don't show here with an arrow, this is the evaporator control valve. Um, has a tube out there that goes to the evaporator and a lower tube that comes from the evaporator. But this is what I found. That is our evaporator control valve. This is the evaporator end. There's the tube that runs from the control valve. This is a tube that runs into the evaporator. And look at this wire. That wire actually goes to the blower fan motors. And when I saw that, I was actually, this photograph was taken at ground level after I got the thing down. But when I saw it up on the roof, I saw this wire and I thought, that's a really weird place to put a wire between two pieces of tubing that are going to have vibration in them. And when I tugged here, it wouldn't move. I thought, oh, that's curious. So 
When I started to dismantle it, I've, ta I've removed the evaporator valve on the tube that came from the evaporator valve, and it showed this tube and that bit of wire. And that, I thought, well, that's welded on there. Now, copper, of course, melts at 1,082 degrees Celsius. A vehicle fire will not get that hot. When I saw that, I thought, hey, this is arc damage. We're on the money. So, I'm getting ahead of myself. What I did was I cut through here, cut through there, snipped that wire there, snipped that wire there. On scene, I took another photograph of it and it went into the evidence bag and was sealed. So, I got it back to the office and I stuck it under the digital microscope and that's what I found. I thought, well, that is absolutely, definitely arc damage. And we've got these wires, you know. That, to me, is saying that wire was arcing. Nice little point there, that's good, OK. Where are we going? No, OK. Um, I also took some standard photographs of this. And I thought, all right. I need to get an exemplar unit. I want to see where the wires go on these HVAC units. So the company that the HVAC unit was purchased from, uh, or the branch of the company, was down in Albury. By this time, I'm back here in Sydney. And I found a branch at Seven Hills. Fantastic. So I get on the phone and get the manager on the phone and tell him who I was. and. I said, look, you know, we've had this fire and, uh, you know, gee, I want to eliminate the HVAC unit, but to do that I need to look at one without the top cover on it. And his response was, well, we've got one on the shelf, that's not a problem, he said, but I'm not unpacking it from the packaging in the US. So... I said, well, it's really important. I said, it's so much so, I'll give you $200 if you unpack it. Couldn't buy it. So if I wanted one of these HVAC units to look at, I was going to have to spend $2,000. And again, insurance company... Look, I work for insurance companies. Insurance companies are mercenary animals. They don't want to spend money. Um, so I couldn't look at an exemplar unit. I did find the company that made the HVAC unit, um, I found a, I think it was about 300 page manual on their website, which I downloaded. And I went through and I actually found a photograph, not a very big one, and not in very good resolution, but I found a photograph of one of these HVAC units without the top on it and the wiring didn't go between two tubes. So knowing that nobody else had had the lid off this thing, I could only conclude that when they built the HVAC unit, somebody was having a bad day and didn't tie the wiring down properly. So it's been between these two tubes over the four weeks that this truck had been running. We've got vibration, et cetera, et cetera, and the vibration has ultimately worn through the insulation of the wire. And the last time the ignition was on was just prior to 1800 hours, the day before the fire was discovered. And the only answer I could conceivably come up with is that we've had a, a, a slow smouldering fire start but before the ignition is off. And this is the other thing I meant to say. Um, those HVAC units, once the ignition is off, there is no power to them. So the fire had to start when 
the ignition was last on. The owner hasn't realised. It's then got through to the thermoplastic interior bezel, set that on fire, that's dropped down, and we've had this slow fire that's ultimately worked its way through the cab and caused the fire. Now, the interesting part about it, the gentleman that owns that truck just happened to be the deputy captain of the local RFS. And he got the call from the guy that found it, saying, yeah, 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 mate, your truck's on fire. Um, so he's gone down, had a look, and I said, well, what did you see? He said, well, the, the cabin was just like it is now. The only thing that was still going was the, the front tyres were still smouldering. I thought, well, you know, um, I, I, I can't prove it any other way, so that's possible. But, is that the end of the slide? That is the end of the slide. Falling back to the requirement to utilise a scientific method, I thought, OK, I think this fire started because of an electrical short because of a manufacturing fault in the HVAC unit. How are we going to test it? I thought, oh, this is a chance to play with fire. So I set up the workbench. I got a piece of copper tubing of roughly the same diameter, same wall thickness as the HVAC unit. I got some wire, again, of the same gauge. And I sat there with a gas torch Holding the wire, well, I wasn't holding the wire, the, the pliers and the grips were holding the wire onto the copper tube and sat there for 20 minutes and it was glowing nice red and all the rest of it and it looked all pretty but wouldn't melt it onto the copper tubing. Cool. Okay. Let's do test number two. So test number two was the negative side of a 12 volt automobile battery was hooked up to the copper tubing and the positive side was hooked up to the piece of wire and we arced it out. And guess what? I wandered the wire to the copper tubing. I thought, well, there you go, okay. So, that's where we went with it. Because of the fact that I couldn't get my hands on a HVAC unit of the same type and examine it and all the rest of it, we could only say, most likely cause, um, which you know might not have pleased the insurance company because it basically denied them any chance of suing the manufacturer of the HVAC unit for the loss of the truck. The fact that the manufacturers in the United States also presents a problem because running a, a recovery action overseas um, apart from being, if not almost impossible, is damned expensive. So um, that was it. Questions? Well, in the Isuzu's, the fuse box is actually placed in the centre of the dashboard, low down on the truck. Um, you've seen the photograph of the cabin. I did find what was left of the fuse box, which was a great mass of molten pink plastic with all these wires coming out of it. And yeah, you know, I, I suppose best guess one to two hundred wires. Um, that wasn't going to tell me anything at all. Um, but the fact that there was no damage to the battery leading, and there was no damage to the leading from the batteries to the um, tilt tray control panel, 
I took to be sufficient evidence that we didn't have an electrical fault. Um, as it turns out, the owner of the truck um, had decided to get buy a tilt tray because he thought it would be a good idea, a good way to um, provide for his family. Um, anybody that knows anything about the towing industry in New South Wales, and particularly in Sydney, um, will know that over the years there have been a few incidents where people have sort of practiced making Molotov cocktails and dropping them onto tow trucks. In fact, uh, some years ago, um, and we're talking uh, about the mid-90s, the tow truck wall was such that um, we had one of it, one tow truck driver, apart from somebody very badly attempting to burn his truck, which failed. Um, they stood on the corner of one road and fired five 223 rifle rounds through his house. Um, which was interesting. Uh, and a 223 round won't go a long way. Um, in fact, uh, one of the rounds went clean through the outside wall, um, straight through the bedroom and through uh, the wall on the opposite side of the bedroom. Um, I, I suspect uh, that our um, tilt tray owner probably trod on somebody's toes and somebody decided that he wasn't going to be in the towing industry much longer. Um, that tow truck actually did make the news on Friday the 12th of uh, February. And uh, I tend to, when, some, when it's got wheels attached and it catches fire, I usually sit up and take notice because there's a reasonable chance that I might get involved with the thing. Any other questions? Uh, the second question I had was you talked about your evidence gathering. Yeah. Um, there's, there's obviously a, a standard for when you make the fire for the collection of evidence and that sort of thing. You don't obviously hand your, all of your evidence over to the police or anyone, do you? No. Do you but. Um, <laughs> now, that, that's a bit of a vexatious question. Um, my wife would say, yeah, he doesn't throw anything away. <laughs> um, being a mere male, I, I, I have a bad habit of keeping things. I mean, in, in our uh, archive repository, I have an 18-litre tub full of motor vehicle keys. And the earliest key that was collected was 1990. Um, yeah, I, I don't throw things away. There might there may be a statutory requirement for it, but I just sort of hang on to these things. Sorry. Generally, um, look, I don't know of any statutory requirement. Um, my guide is um, if we've got solicitors involved and the case has been run and finalised, then I can dispose of the evidence. But I never dispose of the evidence until I have a solicitor or an insurance company saying, you don't need to have that anymore. And I usually have to chase them uh, because at the moment in the archives repository, um, apart from, uh, let me see, I've got a partially dismantled blow box from a Z a Mercedes tip of the court fire last year. I've got the wheel, a front steer wheel and tyre from a truck that was involved in a serious accident that I'd really like to get rid of. Um, yeah, oh, look, I've got, I've got all sorts of bits and pieces in there and they just seem to accumulate. Oh, and that's right, my wife keeps on reminding me I've got an oil pump from a uh, man prime mover sitting in the garage in a cardboard box. And that's been there for about four years. <laughs> so, yeah. There were no tool marks or anything that you could see on the doors or? On? On the scenario one? So no, no.
No, no. The 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 when we're looking for a forced entry to a vehicle and we look outside the vehicle on the ground and we're looking for broken glass fragments, no smoke staining, that sort of business. Um, again, the owner did a wonderful job of cleaning up the scene for me. You know, I, I mean, I don't think the gutter has, has been that clean in years, but it certainly was after he had finished. Uh, I did door knock the neighbours and um, like the owner there first, well the neighbours heard the owner yelling and screaming and trying to put it out, the owner was woken by popping sounds which I think um, was probably um, tyres going off, um, windows uh, breaking under thermal shock. I mean, there was plenty of glass inside it, but the glass wasn't of sufficient quality for me to say, well, that was broken before, th uh, before fire or post fire. Um, unfortunately, with safety glass, as you know, it beads into it, and if you get thermal shock, um, you're still going to have that same you know, a little fragmented pattern to it. Um, but, uh, so you, what you're looking for is fragments of glass that's clean on both sides. And you'll only find that outside the vehicle, not inside the vehicle. Yeah. But well, if, if, if it can't be proved that the owner did it, yeah. um, then they, they will have to pay out. If it's proved, and if it's proved that it's a third party, like it's the business, which is taken a situation, they find someone... Well, on, on that, I've, um, I've been speaking to the police on the thing, yeah. um, and they're... There's no direct threat um, to the owner. It's not like, you know, um, uh, Fred's rapid towing, for instance, rang him and said, listen, this is Fred, and if you keep on working, mate, your truck's going to get burnt. There was none of that. Um, there were some, you know, warnings to him, but they were um, not such that would... Um, could be taken as a credible threat to um, the safety of the vehicle or the owner. So if there's no evidence that the owner did it himself, the policy might have been taken. Yep. Out. Yeah. And uh, the, the other important thing that you need to consider when you're dealing with insurance is that if an insurance company declines a claim, they have a procedure that they must follow by law, and that is they must write to the owner and say, Dear, dear insured, we're not paying your claim because if you don't like this decision, these are the options that you have. Now, option number one is to take that off to internal dispute resolution, and every insurance company have to have an IDR officer. Um, so the first stage is you, if, if I had a car that was stolen or burnt and the insurance company said, no, nah, we're not paying you because we, we really don't think it's a legit claim, I'd then take it off to IDR. And if IDR found for the insurance company and I still wasn't happy, I could take civil action against the insurance company, which of course will cause me, cost me money. Or there's the free version, and the free version is called the Financial Ombudsman Service, or FOS. And if you, the owner can lodge a complaint with FOS, it costs the owner nothing. It costs the insurance company $2,500. And if FOS get it, 
the, they will write to the insurance company and say, dear insurance company, we've had a complaint from ABC. We want A, your fee, and B, we want your entire file. Now that file is not only the proposal, the claim form, premiums, underwriting records, it is also including investigator reports, forensic reports, anything that the, that insurance company gathers in the process of handling that claim all go to FOS. And FOS will look at this thing and they will come up with a determination either for the claimant or for the insurance company. Um, generally it's for the claimant and if they do find for the claimant the insurance company have no cause of appeal and they have to pay the claim. And the two and a half thousand. Yep. Um, if FOS find for the insurance company, which is, I must say, rare, um, then the owner can still proceed with civil action if they choose to. I mean, the FOS, um, originally, several years ago, um, there was a group formed called the Insurance Inquiries and Complaints. That morphed into FOS. Um, and the IEC um, came up with some very, very curious decisions. In fact, I had one of my clients, uh, the claims manager for one of my clients, uh, call me one day to run past, uh, run a, a scenario past me. And the scenario was it was a Victorian motor vehicle theft claim. The vehicle, uh, it was I, some, some ordinary vehicle, a Commodore or whatever, Commodore Falcon, something like that. So it had been allegedly stolen and recovered burnt out. Um, the insurance company, like most insurance companies back then, if it was a theft, investigators had to automatically be appointed. So they appointed an investigator and the investigator went off and interviewed the owner, the claimant and went through a set of questions that we suggested um, some months, years earlier, that these are the basic questions that an investigator should be asking. So we deal with qualifying the person. Who are you? Where do you live? How old are you? Do you have a valid driver's licence? And basically we, we go through and we re-underwrite the risk. Ask all the questions that are normally asked on the proposal form. Have you ever had your licence cancelled or suspended, blah, blah, blah? Do, have you ever been charged with a criminal offence? And that question came up and the guy said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I have. And the investigator said, well, would you like to tell me about it? Which is the operative way. And he told him about it and he had been charged with um, conspiracy to defraud a, an insurance company. He had been charged with public mischief, false report of theft of motor vehicle, and burning of a motor vehicle for the purposes of an insurance claim. Now, hello? So, needless to say, none of this was disclosed on the proposal non-disclosure, relevant fact, then we bring in the rule of utmost good faith. Well, you knew about this and you should have told us and if you told us, then we would not have insured you for the same conditions and the same rate, which is the out that insurance companies have. So they declined the claim and wrote off the letter, well, we're declining your claim because this, this, this and this. And these are your options, so we took it to the IEC. 
IEC came up with a determination and went back to the insurance company and said, insurance company, this gentleman's previous criminal has history has absolutely no bearing on the current claim. Pay it. So that's why the claims manager came to me and asked me what I thought. And I can't tell you the rest of it, and particularly seeing um, uh, Monday week, I'm going to be sitting in front of one of the guys from the FOS at the International Association of Auto Theft Investigators Seminar down in Melbourne. It could be an interesting thing because the title of his paper is Investigators Hired Guns. And I'm going to be listening to that very, very carefully and I, I sort of resisting the fact that I'm getting angry already. But anyway, that's another story. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> forensic, I don't get a time frame. We do get them done as quickly as possible. And there's a very good mercenary reason for that because I don't get paid until I produce a report. In general investigation, um, we are required, and in one case, one of our clients, we actually have a signed service level agreement, which is a contract of this is what we will do, this is what you will do, and woe betide me if we don't come up to, to that spec. Um, but we say to the insurance companies, if you instruct us in a general investigation matter, we will contact the claimant within 24 hours of receipt of instructions. And generally, um, I look to uh, be doing an interview with the claimant within the first five days of that instruction, or first working week of that instruction, and going through and gathering all the financial information, the mechanical information and witness information as quickly as we possibly can. Um, because the insurance companies have timelines that they need to work with under the general code of practice um, we don't want to um, impinge on that. And the other thing is, every week that I have a file amp and every Monday I have to issue what we call in our office matter update reports. And I really hate writing matter update reports because we don't charge a client for doing that. So I'd rather send them a real report worth, a, you know, $800, $1,000 than write up a matter update report. Uh, but every Monday, every open file we have in our office is reported on. Um, but from the forensic side of it, um, it, it's slightly different because they're engaging me not as a private investigator, which I am, but as a forensic expert. So um, we still issue matter update reports on that. Um, because they, they will have brokers on the phone saying, oh, well, what are you doing, and all the rest of it. In fact, on um, last week's excavator um, fire, I, had, uh, I inspected the machine on the Friday, um, arrived at about uh, eight, uh, nine, 18 hours, uh, I left there at uh, 14.30 hours. Surprisingly rather clean, actually, but it's, uh, I usually get come out, well, you all play with fire, you know what it's like, get covered in muck and garbage and all the rest of it, but uh, I, uh, I'm surprised I remain so clean on that one. Um, and then I started chasing the company that built the excavator to get their technical information. Unfortunately, this excavator was actually um, uh, purchased by the insured in Ireland in 2012 and imported to Australia. And there are no exemplars 
of that particular excavator in this country, um, which makes life a little bit difficult. So it's a case excavator. So I've been dealing with the good folk at uh, CNH Industries, who are the manufacturers of case, and after passing the test with their in-house counsel, um, satisfying her that we weren't about to go off and sue Case for something. Um, they uh, gave us full cooperation and we've been able to get uh, the hydraulic schematics, the electrical schematics and um, there's been this two-way uh, passing of information between my office and CNH to work out what happened and what's actually happened is that one of the hydraulic return hoses failed um, and even though the hydraulic system generally works at 350 bar which equates to 5072 psi uh, but this hydraulic line had uh, poppet valves at either end and those poppet valves reduced the um, 350 bar down to 2 bar or about 75 psi. Mind you, when I dipped the hydraulic oil tank, I found about 25 mils of oil still in the bottom of the tank. I thought, ha, ah, right. Hose has failed. It's atomised hydraulic oil over the engine and over the um, exhaust manifold. Sufficient. The truck, uh, the unit had been working all day and was in fact being driven back to the compound when the fire started. Um, I've got this wonderful photograph that the driver took, standing about 200 metres away with his phone, and there's this great pall of flame and smoke coming out of it. I thought, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, so. Hopefully tomorrow I will receive the final answer to the question uh, and then I'll start doing up a, re a report and hopefully get rid of that before I fly to Melbourne on the Sunday. As a matter of fact, the the owner's 16-year-old daughter pulled out the phone and took a video of Dad fighting the fire. It wasn't particularly good because the aperture of the uh, um, phone's camera just closed down, so we've just got a, a um, basically a, a great mass of light with a shadow holding a garden hose and a lot of screaming and carrying on. Um, but that, that was it. Um, I, I did go back to the towing company um, and ask them if they took any photographs, could they please send them to me? Um, unfortunately, tow companies, if it's a collision, they will take photographs. And I will regularly call, if I'm doing collision work, I'll regularly get hold of the tow company and say, hi guys, how are you going, me? Uh, have you got photographs? Can you please send them to me? Or I'll come and get them or whatever. Because that will give me vehicle position on road and all of that business. In fires, if they take any photographs, usually it's when they drop the truck off at where it is. Um, in this case, they, they didn't take any photographs at all. But keeping in mind, we've got a tow truck driver who is probably using his camera in his telephone. They are getting better. Uh, but usually at the worst possible resolution, so you get a photograph of about that big, and if you expand it any larger, it pixelates to useless garbage and who has not been trained in the art of forensic photography. Yeah, well, uh, it's, uh, I was talking to a tow truck driver. In fact, the, the towing company that took the um, excavator, the excavator actually burnt down at Clyde Bucker 
and um, I was getting ready to drive up to Clyde Bucker to look at it when I got the call from the insurance company to say they d had decided to move it from Clyde Bucker down to Mannheim at Newcastle. So don't go. But um, I was talking to the, uh, to the towies and he said, no, we didn't take any photographs, but we've, we've got some photographs and he described them and I already had them. Um, and he was talking about it and I said, look, I'm happy enough to take a drive up to Port Macquarie and sit down with you guys and show you how to take photographs from a forensic perspective. It would really be helpful. But collision work, you'll get photographs, uh, you know, a lot of photographs. Um, and that's important, particularly in, um, let's see, uh, 3 December 2013, there was a fatal truck accident down on the Hume Highway at Campbelltown involving a rigid tipper and a dog uh, trailer and seven other motor vehicles. Truck driver died at scene. Um, the crash investigation unit was on it, as they usually are in fatals. And of course, as soon as the crash investigation guys arrived, they declared it a crime scene. So I wasn't going to get in there. Uh, and I relied very, very heavily on the photographs that the tow truck uh, operators took to show me vehicle positions on road. Um, and then, of course, there was the other one that uh, a lot of you will probably remember in uh, October 2014 when the rigid taut liner came screaming down Warringah Road to do the left-hand turn and rolled and crushed eight cars. We did that one. Again, crime scene. Um, I was notified 24 hours after the event in any case, so it didn't really matter. And we went back to the towies and we got their photographs. And, um, and of course, the security footage that everybody saw and you know had a look. I can tell you now, the truck driver definitely wasn't do in first gear. He told me he was, but he wasn't. Um, but um, I had a few clues on that one, and we actually. Um, after talking to Crash Investigation, I, the ne I got a call at about 6.30 at night from the officer at uh, CIU that was doing that. And as a result of that conversation, uh, the next morning I rang my client and said, when this vehicle is released from impound by police, I want a forensic mechanical engineer, please. And the client took my advice and we did that and the brakes were so far out of adjustment he had no chance so um, and as a result of our inquiries please re-examine the truck but that's another story any other questions no. well I don't don't think I put anybody to sleep thank you for your time